Happy Pride, everybody. Welcome, uh, you know, and welcome to this year's uh, What Does Pride Mean to Us panel in honor of Pride Month. So we're really happy that you're all, all able to join us today. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Jagadisha Deva Shridekis. I use he, him pronouns. And I am a research assistant professor and the associate director of the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing, or ISGEM, as we call it for short. So I'll begin today's event by just saying a little bit about ISGEM, and then I'll have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, uh, Kim Hunt, for today's event. So ISGEM was founded in 2015 and is the first university-wide institute in the country focused focus exclusively on um, research to improve the health and well-being of the sexual and gender minority communities and is the largest institute in wealth researching LGBTQ plus health. As a university-wide institute at Northwestern, our mission is to connect scholars from numerous disciplines with the SGM community to forge collaborations and stimulate innovative research to improve SGM health and well-being. We provide opportunities for high level research and training for the next generation of SGM scholars and disseminate knowledge to SGM communities, the public, uh, other scholars, policymakers, educators, and service providers. So enough about SGM and let me just speak a little bit about uh, today's event. So in honor of Pride Month, a time when we celebrate the, future, the culture, voices, rights, and diversity of LGBTQ plus communities, we have a, a moderator and trio of panelists uh, who will be exploring the topic, what pride means to us. So this is our second annual Pride event and our moderator was one of the featured panelists at last year's event. So we're really honored to have her uh, moderate this today's event. So this year, uh, the Institute um, invite, invited the panel speakers to discuss the theme, what pride means to us with the goal of elevating and featuring uh, lesser heard voices within the LGBT community. LGBTQ plus community. And really this conversation was born out of ISGEM's um, equity committee, um, thinking about how do we uh, you know, use our, our, speak, our speaker series as a, way to, as a platform and a way to elevate um, voices that we, that we don't care so much about. So this year, um, this year's panel features three speakers assigned female at birth. And our panelists will offer their thoughts, their insights, uh, to speak from the various perspectives as individuals, as members of communities, and as leaders, advocates, and activists. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite our panelists and to introduce our speaker, our moderator for the event, Kim Hutt. Thank you so much, John uh, It's a pleasure to be here again today. Thank you, and thank you, Andrew, for inviting me to uh, be a part of the program again this year. And thank you all for uh, being here with us today. Uh, and to those of you in the Chicago area, congratulations on surviving what we thought was gonna be a tornado last night. <laughs> those sirens freaked me out. I grew up in Missouri. And so hearing tornado sirens was a regular occurrence in the summer. So it just took me right back to my childhood. And I hope you have all survived just fine. Uh, I am so excited about today's conversation and, and a little worried about the time uh, because <laughs> I know each of the folks on the panel, I, I know how we can cut up, but we're going to try to keep it clean and keep it within the time frame. Um, as Jagadisha said, I'm Kim Hunt. I'm executive director of Pride Action Tank, which is a project of AIDS Foundation Chicago, where I'm also the senior director of policy and advocacy operations. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Pride Action Tank, it's a project incubator and think tank focused on improving outcomes and opportunities for LGBTQ folks. I have had the pleasure of working with each of the folks on the panel with Pride, through Pride Action Tank and um, outside of Pride Action Tank through another organization I used to run called Affinity Community Services that Amani was also a part of. Uh, and so I am thrilled for this conversation. I will reiterate something that Andrew said. Uh, we'd love to get the energy from the audience. So would love to have your comments, your questions, your shade, whatever it might be uh, in the chat. Reactions are great too. We love those. Uh, for the uh, panelists, I encourage you to lean into your curiosity and I don't have to be the only one asking questions. So if someone says something that you wanna know more about, feel free to jump in. Uh, I don't have any uh, ownership over this role. We are all talking together. I also want to warn folks that I live across the street from a fire station. <laughs> so occasionally you may hear a siren. Most of us are at home, so we are used to these things after two years of doing that. Uh, so uh, let's jump into the program. 
uh, Jack Adishu uh, talked about the motivation for um, uh, having this particular panel this year. And one of the terms he used is assigned female at birth. Now that is not an identity that we say out in the world, as we know. Uh, so I wanna invite the panelists to uh, tell us your name, a little bit about yourself, of course, your pronouns, um, how you identify in terms of your sexual orientation and your gender identity, and what pride means to you. And I will start with the other Kim in the room, Kim number one, uh, Kim Fountain. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 Kim number two. <laughs> let's be clear, let's be clear where that honor lies. Um, so yeah, I, uh, so Kim Fountain, I use uh, she, they pronouns and I identify as a dyke and uh, that's very much tied to my very working class background for me. Um, I, uh, yeah, um, just to let you know where I am, I'm at the uh, San Diego LGBTQ Center as their deputy CEO and I'm also on the board of directors of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. So we do a lot of reproductive justice work for uh, Asian women and girls. And so, um, or using that framework. And um, so what pride means to me, God, you know, that one, It, I feel like I've thought about this ever since we sort of went over these questions and I thought about, um, you know, it, and it changes. And I figure, I, I think every time I watch the news that changes for me, you know, like where I'm orienting myself. But for me, it means collective action and celebration. So for me, pride is a time where globally we see each other. And for me, I'm a cultural anthropologist and particularly around um, identity-based violence. And so when I think about the fact that we don't have a homeland, right? We can't point, this is where we're from, or this is where our ancestors are from. But we can say that was, we're, we're a global culture. And how cool is that, right? How amazing is that? And when I see people like, you know, like they take away your history and they take away your culture and they take away everything that makes you human or they try, right? They try really hard. And pride is that one, that moment for me where we reassert all of that collectively. So that is what pride means to me. Awesome. And let's go with Lauren, then Imani. Uh, Mado, which is thank you in my language, Kim. Hesche, which is hello. My name is Lauren Miller. My pronouns are she, her. I identify as a cisgender uh, pansexual uh, woman. I am both African American and Muscogee Creek, which is a, a federally recognized Native American tribe, uh, originally from Georgia, now in Oklahoma and part of Alabama, but I'm a native Chicagoan. Uh, I am a licensed social worker and I'm working as a trauma uh, therapist. Specifically, I just received, uh, I'm one of two people to receive the postgraduate fellowship uh, through Women Care Trauma and Training Center. So I'm pretty chuffed about that. Thank you. Um, and I've been around the nonprofit world, kind of like a bad penny. I keep showing up, hopefully shining a little, but I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what does pride mean to me? I would second a lot of what Kim Fountain has. Um, oh, thank you. Someone said, congrats. Thank you. Um, I, I would say I second a lot of what Kim Fountain has to say in the sense that we are a global culture. And I like how you framed that, Kim. My undergrad was anthropology, so I feel like I'm spanning you and Imani in a way. Um, but I definitely would agree with that. It's a global culture and I take pride in shining, but I also sometimes feel like as a person with so many intersectional identities, um, cause I'm also disabled and um, I feel that pride can sometimes bring a lot of struggle too, because sometimes I feel like I have to fight for my place at the table because even within the marginalized specter, spectrum, I feel like as a black native disabled woman, sometimes I'm pushed to the corner and I have to fight with other marginalized folk. So I feel like the struggle is real, which can be sad and overwhelming, but at the same time, I'm also really glad it's here and I enjoy the parts where I am seen. So that's where I will say, I will turn it over to Imani because Kim Hunt is right. I can talk, all of us can, but I don't want to be the only one. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be on a panel with these um, brilliant, brilliant folks. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Imani Rupert Gordon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I identify as a Black, cisgender, queer woman or lesbian. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the executive director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Um, we work to achieve civil and human rights for all LGBTQ folks um, and their families and do it through litigation, legislation, public policy and public education. Um, for me, when I think about pride, 
You know, it's changed over it's changed over the years, certainly. Um, but I will say that for right now in this moment, it um, pride provides an opportunity. Um, you know, I I had a bit of an existential crisis not too long ago. No, not uh, I mean, well, I guess a few years ago now. And I really wondered what is it that I'm doing with my life? And it lasted two days. And after the second day, but it was it was a hard two days, y'all. But um, after the two days, I it just uh, you know it was just clear as day that I um, I want to make the world better. And um, and Pride Month, I'm reminded because we're speaking a lot about how to bring people in and what we can do better. And we don't always have that. We don't always have that spot. And not everyone is interested in, in listening to it all during the year. But when we're talking about it in Pride Month, um, hopefully it's a little easier for folks to talk about it all during the year. And so I think Pride for me means an opportunity. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate everything that everyone has, has said. And I forgot to say that I, uh, identify as a cisgender woman, both uh, queer and lesbian. I like both those terms as well. Um, and, you know, Lauren, you, you mentioned, um, and, and, you know, Kim and Amani, you kind of went into this too, about, you know, not always seeing yourself um, in the LGBTQ community or in the pride celebrations. And I'm wondering what are some practices, personal practices, uh, for being seen, but also describe how your work helps you and other folks that, and who have been historically marginalized um, be seen as well. And let's do Lauren, Amani, and Kim this time. All right, thank you for that question and not surprised by the thought provoking aspects of it, Kim. Um, I think it's a great question. I think I'll go with the second part first in the sense of well, as a trauma therapist, I have found that being there within the space to provide support to LGBTQ folks, because my practice area mainly around surrounds uh, survivors of violence who are LGBTQ identified, I have found that throughout that practice, there has been a way of both being restorative for the client as well as myself. As Kim Fountain said, you know, we are a collectivist group. We have a shared history. We do have a global situation uh, network, even though we are not necessarily like you had said, Kim, from a homeland per se. So therefore, when working with other collectivist groups, sometimes you can find this commonality of restorative justice and healing and being seen for people as well as yourself in that process of collectively healing or providing that form of therapy. There are times when I feel that we are not always seen. And, and one of the ways I also like to challenge that is by speaking up and saying, which is very hard, um, hey, I know this is supposed to be a safe space. Maybe everyone in here is queer and a cis woman, but I feel extra marginalized because I'm BIPOC or because I'm disabled or because of any number of identities I carry. And it's hard. Um, and it's scary because you're like, I finally thought I found acceptance and now I may be pushed out. But between the process of embracing what is there as well as speaking up about what isn't is how I try to reclaim it. So I will step back now. Oh my goodness, well, this is a big question. Um, you know, um, well, I'll start with um, I'll start with what we what we do because you know honestly I think one of the things that is really important to me is that I really I, I think a lot about the concept of authenticity and the reason is because during a time right now so many people look to leaders and folks in our positions and um, they say you know what um, we want you to be your authentic self we want you to bring all of yourself to the table and not thinking that actually many of us got to the table by actually learning how not to be our authentic self that from very early on our authentic self was a shaved or polished version and so when we get to these places and we are actually working to be authentic it's actually quite a bit of work to be truly authentic because um and you might even say there's a part of us that's authentic um that's just a polished version of us and that's how we're used to behaving so um i think that's also just a really quick question when you say uh, like a tough question when you say you know how do you how do you um how are you seen because i don't always know how to answer that specifically for myself you know but um i just try to come in i try to be honest and i try to always just say that i am trying to be authentic you know and sometimes it's going to be um incredibly polished and sometimes it's not you know um but when i think about the work that we do i think 
I try to I try to create processes and a structure where someone like me would have felt like like she could have been her authentic self, you know? And so I think about that when, you know, it's Pride Month so, so often. So we're talking about LGBTQ identities a, a, a lot of time, but, you know, for me, I, I don't separate these things. You know, uh, my experience as a black woman, as a queer woman, um, these aren't things, I don't separate them out because I don't experience them differently. And so, um, and so that's how, that's how I think about all of this. And so when I think about the work that we do, you know, um, I just, um, I've been in this, you know, I, you know, spent almost a decade in uh, Chicago with you brilliant folks. And now I've been in California for about two and a half years. And um, I am running a legal organization and I am not a lawyer. And one of the things that I say to folks is that I'm a regular smart person and I'm leading this organization. So if I don't understand it, then we need to do it better. And I think that that's something that's really important that for me, that's what leading with authenticity authenticity is right now. Uh, it takes me a lot of time to prep and understand all the things that we're doing because often we are talking about legal theory that I don't understand. But what matters is that we all benefit from the work of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. But if it's only open to people that have law degrees, then we're really not able to really show folks all the work that we're doing. And so there's a little bit more work on my, on, on my end uh, uh, understanding it and then synthesizing it. But I think the the trade off for that is so incredibly important because then we have more people thinking about how we want this work to look. And so I have been talking for a while, so I will um, put a pin in it here, but uh, happy to come back to it. I just want to keep listening. <laughs> That's what I want to keep doing. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Oh, this is so amazing to hear you speak. Um, you know, for me, you know, yes to all of that, right? Yes, I love the idea that Lauren talks about, you know, the collective and these collective actions and money about, you know, translation and sort of getting the words out and things like this. And for me, um, get all of that. And I get, so I started my work in this, it's weird to call it a movement, right? In the movement kind of moment, right? As a community organizer. So that's kind of where, I, you know, I sort of cut my teeth, if you will. And so, what I like to do is to be in groups, you know, whether it's, you know, working in, you know, working class communities or in groups like, you know, like with sex workers, for instance, so important. And, you know, in these moments, as somebody who I don't have the experience of doing sex work, and I don't have the, I have the experience of being working class, but like, you know, not of extreme poverty, for instance. And so if I think about those moments, like with my white skin privilege, even though my mom is an immigrant to this country and a survivor of war and occupation and all these things, I still come with a significant amount of white skin privilege. I, I don't know, sat in the right chair for long enough that they handed me my PhD, right? And I did all these things. And my moment, my sort of feelings in those moments, I just shut up, right? Just listen, stop talking, just listen to what's being said and then leverage whatever privilege I have to make certain that I do my part in making certain that we, you know, I am listening, following, and using my my you know those privileges to lift up. So as much as I can do my part. So, Whew, so many gems here. Um, and again, I encourage folks to, and I see some people doing that. Uh, put your amens and hallelujahs in the chat. Uh, any questions? Any comments? All of that. Uh, we do want to leave room uh, towards the end for folks to ask questions too, but you can, as they come up, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, so I want to pick up on, on something that both uh, Imani and, and Kim and, and you too, Lauren, have, have um, at least alluded to. Um, and, you know, I will back up by giving a little context for this question. So I was, um, uh, executive director of Affinity Community Services here in Chicago, um, an organization uh, started and, and founded by and uh, really working with Black queer women. Um, and uh, gosh, almost over 30 years ago, about 30 years ago, uh, I was the first executive director uh, 15 years in um, for about seven years. And for much of my time as executive director, I was the only uh, female identified paid executive director of an LGBTQ organization in Chicago. 
only paid <laughs> full-time executive director who was a person of color uh, in Chicago. And it was a lonely table. Um, and so I'm curious in, in all of your work, how have you, and this goes back to authenticity and our reactions and all of that as the fire truck goes by, um, how have you shown up in LGBTQ spaces? How are you able to do your work in LGBTQ spaces as uh, a BIPOC uh, woman? Uh, and uh, navigating those spaces. And we'll do Amani Kim and Lauren this time. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so when I, when I stepped into um, the position that I'm in now, um, I was the only black woman that was leading a national LGBTQ organization. And now there are several, there are several more. Um, and uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing to see. But one of the things that I did, I remember, you know, um, Nadine Smith is, um, is the executive director for Equality Florida. Equality Florida does amazing, amazing work. And when I reached out, when I, when I got there, she immediately reached out to me and, um, uh, had me on this panel where they were talking and it was this amazing panel with, um, other, uh, uh, black leaders doing LGBTQ work and Lizzo actually got like found it and like put it on her story. So there was a ton of people here and it started getting really, really big. And she wanted to make sure that I was there when I, when I first got, when I first got in and I was so incredibly grateful for that. And I, and I thought about what that meant for me um, because I started my first day in the office was also the first day of shelter in place. So the first thing that I did was close the office and haven't opened it since. So, you know, it was a different way of, it was a different way of starting and um, it would have been scary anyway, but not being in front of people was so incredibly hard and um, just how, how gracious she was uh, to include me on that panel. It meant so much to me at the time. And um, so really something that I try to do now is um, I reach out to new EDs as they come. And um, that's been a thing that I did. And I didn't realize it would be something that I would do early on as a relatively young um, executive director um, here, but um, there was a spot for it, honestly. And um, I was, and honestly, I'm just thrilled to, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do that. Um, I have the privilege of co-leading a, a national ED call like every every couple of weeks with um, uh, Kara, the um, LGBTQ task force executive director. Um, and it's just been really, you know, falling into this has been really helpful because honestly, there are a lot of things, like things are easy until they're not. And um, building relationships are going to be the things that's, that are important. But we have to remember, you know, one of the things, like there's so many things that, that we know anecdotally before there's research about it. You know, there's a ton of research about now how difficult it is to raise as, to raise money as um, a leader of color, especially when you are um, following a white executive director, how difficult that is. But I remember when the first black um, woman who ran a national LGBTQ organization, I remember sitting down with drinks for her and her telling me that before there was research out there talking about that. And so um, I think that it's important that while we are, um, you know, we're in a moment right now where we are trusting leadership of a lot of different folks in a way that we never have. Um, but what happens when things get difficult? Where are those support systems? You know, do those types of things exist? And I think that's one of the things that I just want to make sure that I'm that I'm adding, that I'm contributing to. You know, we don't know how to do. There's not a formulaic way to look at this, but I think just getting out there and trying is enough for this. You know, and so that's what that's something that I try to do. Amazing. And you didn't fall into anything, just to be clear. Like <laughs> they were so happy for you to come and share your brilliance and, and your wealth of just knowledge and, and talent. Yeah, um, just gotta shout that out. We gotta support each other in those moments, right? Um, and so, I, you know, so when I went to Chicago, I sat myself in Mona Noriega's chair and who uh, <laughs> was at the Commission on Human Relations. And I said, Mona, talk to me here, like, what, you know, chatty chatty and she, and she finally was like so what do you want from me exactly woman who i don't know in the world but yay and i said i don't want when we're out in public and i'm at an event and you're an event and i'm like hi mona that you say hi back and the minute you say hi back everybody's gonna be like who's mona talking with 
right? Because you find those leaders, like just like Imani was saying, like you find those leaders and lo and behold, it happened. And suddenly I was, you know, in the same sphere as, you know, Kim and Imani and other, you know, wonderful leaders in the space. And I get to share space with Lauren at work and it was just fantastic, right? Like suddenly you're like, oh, you're in good spaces. And so I think being able to like move into those spaces with the confidence that I do belong at this table, right? That, that I am a woman, I'm a woman of color, I'm a dyke, I still belong at this. In fact, not only do I belong at this table, but y'all need to hear what I have to say, you know, and that's super important. Um, and critical as well is to know when to leave, right? Is to know when your talents are not being welcomed, when your talents are not being appreciated, where your resume seems to be taking a hit because you are someplace and not developing and not letting or having those talents flourish. So I think knowing when to leave is also important. Oh, wow. Okay, I would second everything that Imani and Kim have said. And then to popcorn it to you, Kim, I also want to say just as you uh, supported Imani in saying you earned your place, I say the same, you didn't sit in a chair and got your PhD, you earned your PhD and from new school, that's very impressive. So let's, let's all do that. Um, I would agree with everything that said, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I think it's definitely a case of knowing, of making sure I'm seen and making sure, and I also too, similar to Imani, reach up to higher leaders in all the spaces I've been to introduce myself. And it's not as a form of narcissism, but as a point of, hey, I know statistically, I'm most likely going to be overlooked because of all the identities I hold. And I also know that I don't want that to happen. And so this is your chance not to join that statistics league of overlooking me because of insert identities. Um, and I also agree with Kim that it's important to know when to step back. I think as a behavioral health specialist, one of the things I've had to do is often do a lot of self-reflection, like how much of this is definitely because of uh, preconceived prejudice, which it often is, or how much of this is me uh, bringing in my own past work traumas or histories as well. So there's always that balancing act, but I really have tried to address it as everyone here has identified critically, verbally, and, and in, in a way that's like empowering for myself. Um, and also finding the safe spaces to offlet those emotions because it hurts. It hurts when you're overlooked, especially when you think the space is safe. So, um, and the last thing I would say I've had to do is because I do hold so many identities, uh, especially disability, it's so important not to feel like if you're sharing all your identities that people aren't gonna believe you and that you maybe need to hold back. I think when I first started getting into this work, sometimes I was like, okay, I'll definitely acknowledge that I'm a black uh, queer woman, but I felt hesitant sometimes to say, oh, I'm also disabled. Oh, I'm also Native American for fear people will be like, well, you can't be everything um, and make me into a politically correct joke. Um, but the reality is I am. And I wanna share all of that. And I have faced instances where one, if not all those identities prohibit me from going, from accessing the areas I want to access. So seconding everything that's been said plus adding my own spin there is the best way I can say it. And I'm still evolving. It's like a Venn diagram. Ask me this question next year, I'll have more to say. <laughs> and, and can I also add to that along with Lauren? Because I often come from the, because we're taught the language, right? Like like when you say I'm prohib prohibited because of one of my, my identities. And and I know you're going to like this, Lauren, because I know that you're going to agree with me on this one, right? We're prohibited because of other people's oppressive behaviors toward us, right? And I know you, I know you get that better than most folks, right? Like, and that is the thing, right? Naming where that comes from. You know, I always talked, you know, when I first started out doing anti-violence work, you know, and, and people would say, oh, he was beaten because he was gay. And I was like, no, he was beaten because somebody was homophobic and violent and like couldn't control themselves, like refused to control themselves. They could, right? They refused to. They made the choice to harm. And so I feel the same way when people do this, you know, with any one of us on this call, people make the choice to harm. And that is unacceptable. So, yeah. Oh yeah, and thank you for clarifying. 100% agree with that. No, nobody stops me uh, from saying my truth. I meant that the hesitation that I think as we grow into, because we're not born this way. It doesn't like my mom always jokes and says like you know gravy doesn't come with the meat, right? You have to make it. So we have to grow into being able to advocate for ourselves, and I think that's a major part of the growth. So absolutely, yeah. Laura, if I could just hop in too. Do it. <laughs> Lord, I just love everything that you're saying here. And I also, you know, I wanted to name too, um, 
you know, I said, Nadine Smith, there's so many people that were so incredibly helpful, but I wanted to name right now, because I'm sitting in front of these two Kims, um, how incredibly influential both of you were um, to my own professional development. You know, um, I mean, Kim Hunt, um, I mean, over and over, whenever I've had questions and when I continue to have questions, like you are the first person I call, um, you have, I mean, for so, so long, Kim is foxhole material, you know, and um, it, it's just on it. It's been an honor to be your friend and to consider you a mentor of mine. And um, Kim found, you know, honestly, like you changed the way that I looked at what I would do, um, you know, like like we had conversations that that fundamentally shifted the way that I think about the about how I can do work. And I just wanted to name that there have been so many people that are that have been so incredibly influential. But I did just want to name because you two are sitting right here in in front of me. I just wanted to name that because y'all are amazing. Um, and uh, like Lauren, they're vouching for you. And I already believe like I believe it. I believe it. I'm in and I'm already down for everything you're saying. Like. I mean, this is this is outstanding. I'm thrilled to be here, y'all. <laughs> oh, thank you. And likewise, I share everyone's sentiment here. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. And it's a pleasure getting to see you, Imani. I've been stalking you online in a healthy, affirming way. And uh, I, especially as a fellow SSA grad and who's African-American, I'm like, yay. So just want to name it. I love all the affirmation and the clarity and the food analogies. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> And, and I will I will say to the audience, you know, we we warned Jagadisha and Andrew that you know we can talk forever, and I've already got a courtesy check in from Andrew just to be fully transparent. <laughs> it's gonna be great, Andrew. It's gonna okay. Be we're back. We're back. We're back. <laughs> Question um, number one. Yeah. <laughs> I've got. I, okay. Okay. Next question. So uh, as we think about the trajectory of what we're now calling pride, right, you know, we think starting with Stonewall, of course, there was, for those of you who don't know, a lot of, a lot of stuff happened before Stonewall, <laughs> but, but we have chosen that demarcation as, as Stonewall and sort of the, the modern, if you will, LGBTQ plus um, movement and, um, you know, subsequent uh, uh, marches, not parades, but marches were focused on gay liberation, right? And so we've moved, moving, because it's an evolution, it's, it's ever evolving. We talked about equality. Now we're honing in on equity, but more people are talking about liberation, right? And um, Pride Action Tank and, and AFC had a, a series of conversations last year called uh, Co-Creating Futures, a BIPOC LGBTQ summit on policies and practices. And Lauren and Kim were a part of that. And Imani, you and I have had conversations about equity and liberation and those sorts of things. Uh, and one of our, we had a couple of key questions uh, for folks who participated in that summit uh, that I wanna put into this space. And Kim, starting with you and then Lauren and then Imani, and that is what does a liberated future look like for LGBTQ plus folks? Oh, I love this question because hats off to Irva Shivad who just passed, right? She, her and her book, right, Virtual Equality, right? She broke it down between, you know, there's legitimation politics and liberation politics, right? And we really want to just, we've had a lot of those legitimation politics, give me our rights because we're just like you. And I'm like, no, the power of us is that we're not just like you, right? That is our power. And when you start to, you know, assimilate our culture into that sort of mainstream, you know, heteronormative cis sort of world, I I feel like we've lost, we're going to lose the radical power of who we are. Right? We do love differently. We do create families differently. We do move through the world differently. We do think about safety and health differently. Right? And from really powerful perspectives, I think in ways that. Um, a liberated future means that those queer voices that bumping up against heteronormativity and all those other normativity moments, right? Bumping up against that and just dismantling it and, and changing it for everybody. That's that liberated moment for me, right? When, when who we are as a people, as a culture also gets to say, also gets to say, um, or 
at, you know, um, model for the world, like these are more liberated and, and to Imani's point, authentic ways of moving through space with each other, so. Love it. Uh, following up on that, I absolutely cannot disagree in the slightest. Um, I would definitely say it's one that is inclusive to all of us. And I mean the sense of all of who we are as a person. And I'm not just talking about our intersectional identities, like where our families come from, what we pray to or don't pray to, but I mean body shape. I mean how we physically look, how our disabilities impact us. So it's literally all of you as an individual. And then as a collective, we value everybody's valuing of all of them and that we can be open to accountability when we ideally mistakenly do not include everybody because that's again, the growth part. I think as human beings, we're inherently flawed but we have the ability to learn which is what makes us great as a species, right? We beat out the Archaeopithecines, which were humanoids because our species, the Homo sapiens, were able to keep learning from our mistakes. And here we are. And I feel like that's a quality not valued in our species as, as a people. And I feel that as, as human beings, I mean, and so as a result, I think the ability to value us as we are, but also be open to that accountability so we can grow and continue to grow because identities are going to continue to evolve. And the movement, if it's liberated, has to always make room for that growth. I love this. Um, I just, yes, all, yes to all of this. Yes to all of this. Um, I would say something, I would say something similar, you know, um, something I was thinking about, I just pulled this quote a few years ago. I read this study from um, her, the dating app, and it really made me rethink about, you know, what we think about sort of modern pride parades. And it said that 31% of LGBTQ women didn't feel comfortable or welcome at Pride. And 43% of bisexual women and 53% of self-identified queer women um, said that they don't feel welcome um, or supported at Pride. And then 74% of respondents said that they lived in towns where Pride were, Prides were occurring, but only 40% said that they had plans to go. And that really resonated with me because it really made me think about what we're actually, what we are doing, what what liberation means. And I have my own ideas about what that, about what liberation means, but there's no denying the power of Pride Month. There's no denying that, that people pay attention to Pride Month and that there is an opportunity there. But it also means that when we see things like, like Pride blackouts and LGBTQ people processing um, Pride, it's important that we look at how many communities that were so incredibly instrumental in creating this movement that we're celebrating now and don't actually feel comfortable at what might be the largest display of, of, of what this looks like. And so um, if I think about collective liberation, you know, I think that it's going to be with policy change. Um, I think it's going to be with economic justice. I think it's going to be with prison reform. I think it's going to be with criminal justice. Um, but minimally, what we can do is make space for all of us in pride parades. You know, um, what if we did things where you didn't have to afford a float to have a float in the parade? You know, what if we thought about ways that we could be more inclusive so that this felt more represented, more represented to a lot of folks? And during times like this, like we also need to name that there are more anti-LGBTQ bills this year than ever we've ever seen before. And so maybe also during times like this, that during this time that we're celebrating, that maybe this is a time that we could, that our pride parade could be a bit more of protest. It could be a bit, a bit more of um, advocacy coordination. Um, this could be a time that we are actually working to actively work to achieve liberation. And you know, honestly, that's something to celebrate too. But right now we are legitimately fighting for our lives. And I think that that's something that um, we really should, we really should name. And um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things happening right now and it's really scary. Yeah, I appreciate you naming that. Uh, were you going to jump in there? I, yeah, I just want to say like, it, it, it is amazing that a lot of people, and what I like about this panel in particular is that they don't name the fact that there are differences between LGBTQ, right? And like, we just don't name them, right? It gets lumped together so often. And I don't know how many times in the work that I do, you know, in panels or trainings and things where people talk to me and they say, but listen, I don't need to learn all this because I just, I'm going to treat everybody diff or the same, right? And I keep having to say to them, we don't come to your door the same, right? So if 
the minute we walk through your door, we don't suddenly become equal. So you really need to figure out how to celebrate difference, Audre Lord, right? Yay, celebrating that difference, right? So that you're not trying to bury it and, you know, making it easy for yourself. Make it hard on yourself and get some good work done, you know? You preached right there. Thank you. <laughs> I have three children and I don't love them all the same. I know that sounds horrible as a mother. I don't love them all the same. I love them all, but I don't love them all the same um, to, to your point, Kim, absolutely. I wanna throw a term in the conversation that um, I think queer, lesbian, dykes have some interesting history with. <laughs> uh, and it may or may not shape your work probably, does in some way or another, but I want to hear about that. And did I start with you, Kim, before? So it's, it's Lauren's turn. So Lauren, Amani, and Kim. Uh, and, and let me just say, having two anthropologists on a panel, how crazy is that? <laughs> so the term is feminism. <laughs> Kim is like, <gasps> So I want to put this in the, in the space because, you know, historically, you know, there have been some challenges uh, around that term for, for us um, and folks like us. And so just curious to, uh, you know, hear from you, what does feminism mean to you and how or if do you bring it into, bring that term, that, that, that practice, that thought uh, into your work. So starting with you, Lauren, then Amani, then Kim. Oh, thank you for asking the question. That is the elephant in the room. Um, one of them, at least. For me, I do, okay, I do identify as a feminist, but I identify as a feminist in the sense that I acknowledge that word needs to be reclaimed. I think that word has been co-opted by a movement that at its time was probably very pithy and needed as all first movements are, but in that process, they did not, they stepped up, but they did not step back as other generations and iterations came forward, which is why I think now many people are like, oh, I hate the F word. And we're like, are we talking fuck? No, 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 that I'm fine with, it's feminism. And I think that's where it's coming from. The fact that these iterations are hurting from the fact that previous generations wouldn't relinquish or move with it. So then I circle back to what I had said earlier about there has to be room for growth, has to be room for accountability and has to be room for learning. So I use it because it's reclaiming the word. I am a feminist, my mother is a second generation feminist she was second generation black feminist so that's a whole nother panel coming on right there and she would have plenty to say um and then she went into academia so it even keeps going uh but i would say to sum it up um that no i do believe in using it and reclaiming it but there has to be more conversations about the hurt that that word has caused and still causes because it can be very exclusionary to pretty much everyone in this panel and other identities that aren't represented in this panel Um, I would absolutely second all of that. Um, and for all the reasons you said, you know, a word that I, um, that I like a bit more is um, Alice Walker's um, uh, womanist, uh, which is, you know, um, all the good things and not the bad ones. Um, um, and a bit more intersectional too, um, specifically talking about the experiences of, um, of black women, but, you know, in doing so is, um, it's also, in my opinion, just more open to being thoughtful that, that, um, lends itself to, I think, that growth, Lauren, that you're talking about, because that's that's the part that, that matters. We can do the absolute best we can until we need someone else to do something else. And so, and I think that's what our movement has always looked like, and that's where we are in it. And I think, you know, Kim um, uh, Kim found earlier, you were, um, you were talking about also knowing when to leave. And one of the things that I think it's also really important is, 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 is pushing yourself to leave when you've given something and you've learned something and giving an opportunity for someone else. Because I think that's a bit of bravery. I think that's a bit of leadership too. Because not only when you're in these positions, you are, you're, you're giving something, but you're also learning something. And 
there comes a time when it gets easy for you to do these things and you can do it like second nature and, and, you know, like you're having a good time. Everyone's happy with the work that you're doing. But I think that that, I think that part of this work has to be allowing other people to come in and do that, but also then to, to take, you know, if we have people, if we are standing on the shoulders of giants, then we're also building our shoulders up so that people can stand on ours. And we have to give folks an opportunity to lead. And sometimes what that is, is doing something that we would have never understood. But what we have to realize in that moment, and this is what I hope that people understand in, the, in this moment, is that the way that we can have a more nuanced um, understanding and analysis of gender, of sexual orientation, of race, the reason we can do that is because of these early movements. And that's not that's, it's a good thing that we're doing this. It's a good thing that we're doing it. It's based in all of that. And we were able, we're able to see and understand something because of the shoulders that we're standing on. And we're building a world so that folks can stand on ours and they're gonna be able to do things that we haven't done. And I think that, and I, I say this because, you know, too often in our movement, you know, it is hard to coordinate. When we look at our opponents, they do a really great job of coordinating. And the reason it's not, there's some things I actually think they coordinate really well, but there's some things that just go hand in hand. Like when you are not worried about the most underrepresented folks um, and and also couple that with white supremacy, like, like coordinating is not really hard. Ours is a bit more complicated. So our work is harder anyway. And so, I try to minimize as much infighting as possible. And also, and you know, like we're trying to change the world here. We're trying to bring people in. And some of that is how we're how we're learning. It's apologizing when we're wrong. It's, you know, it's it's holding ourselves accountable. It's pushing ourselves to be better. It's remembering when when we wanted people to be better, when we were, when we were saying, hey, just think think, think about it this way. And when people are saying that to us to do that too. And lastly, I'll, I'll just say too, you know, one of the things that really, really stands out to me, I read somewhere once that you should have a mentor, but you should also have a mentor that is um, somewhere in their in their 20s. And that has been something that's so helpful for me because I remember, um, I remember the things that I knew when I was in my 20s and they're different than the things I know now, um, but they're all just as important. And so that's something that, that has been really like um, hugely helpful for me. Goodness. I <laughs> Never going after either one of you. I'm just going to just <laughs> fade into the background. Um, I love that. I love what you both have just said. Um, you know, feminism to me um, is about centering women in my politics, in my social life, in my world. I center women. And I mean that I center women, you know, and, and I am not going down that path of deciding for anybody what that means, you know, just women. And, and it doesn't mean that, you know, and I, you know, you, you bring out sort of Alice Walker, right? It was in search of our mother's gardens, I think it was right, right? That's a womanist moment, right? And so important and so good. And also want to talk about, you know, what people used to say about women who were um, separatist, right? And they'd be like, oh, you hate men, you hate men. And the answer is no, we love women, right? You don't have to hate anybody. You have, you know, like, that, no, I don't have the energy. And, I, and that's right about being a feminist too, is knowing where to put my energy, right? And it's not toward hating, you know, and it's not toward, like you said, division and all that kind of strife. It is about how do we center the people that we love or the communities that we love and really lead with that love to make certain that we're creating those changes. And I feel like in those moments, um, the concept of ownership is a real tricky one because as leaders in movements, whether you're a CEO, an executive director, or higher up somewhere in that, you know, world, we're held accountable for so much. You know, like the buck stops there, we get in trouble, we get dragged through the media, we're, you know, have to, have to be answerable to lots of different types of folks and groups of folks. And that creates for some of us, that's, or for some folks, that sort of sense of ownership. And it's like, stop because then you you know like Lauren pointed out too like you won't leave like you won't you just sit there and then the growth of your organization just halts you know because a lot of leaders keep their organizations at places where they feel like they can this is my world now this is you know and they'll keep the org and, and so what we need to do is really ask of our leaders and, and from a very feminist perspective 
to develop that next generation or to be developed by that next generation and then to move over. And I've tried to do that in my career. Like I'll spend five years, five years, five years in different places, you know, and say like, and, but also making sure that I am bringing people to meetings and introducing them. I like very much like Imani said, right? Like I am doing that work of developing the person who's going to sit in my chair and looking for that person who's like, I want your job. And I'm like, great, let's go. Right. That's a feminist perspective to me, right? That is that making certain that I am looking for those folks who really will fill that chair and, and, and not because I think, you know, you, well, let me back up organizations that look for right fit, right? I'm looking for that person who's the right fit for my organization. I'm like, no, 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 no. You look for the person who's going to challenge you and move you forward, right? That's the person you're looking for to grow the work that you're doing. So that for me being a feminist, that's all what that means to me, you know? And if I could just say one more thing mm -hmm. uh, before going, I do also think that if we come up with a new concept to describe feminism or womanism or whatever, it definitely needs to shy away from the binary terminology to some extent, because there are people who are non-binary, of course, gender fluid, and maybe might find it triggering to use these terms because we don't want to not acknowledge our you know, women, the female identity in any way. I mean, I'm proud to be a cis woman. I'm proud of my trans female friends. I'm, you know, proud of it all. But at the same time, it, the word needs to, I think, have space for everyone to feel included because it can be everyone's narrative, if that makes sense. I wanted to add something to that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Because um, I didn't, I didn't speak too much about sort of what that meant to me in womanhood. And I think that's important. But I also think that it's important to acknowledge that cis women are not the gatekeepers of womanhood. And so um, having pride and ownership in our ident identities needs to recognize that. And I think it's also important that for me as a woman that was assigned female at birth, it's important to recognize that while I experience oppression based on on gender, I also experience privilege as a cisgender woman. And so um, the work to end like anti-trans uh, violence, that is that is squarely in my wheelhouse. That is part of my job. It's the work that, I, that I'm proud to do. It is my responsibility. I think that's really important. And so, and I wanted to name that because it's an important dynamic because we don't often talk about what it's like to experience both oppression and privilege in the same identity. And so our analysis of these things are often not as nuanced as we'd like them to be. And so I just wanted to sort of name, like kind of what you were, were saying, Lauren, but I think that it's so important that, you know, protecting my identity does mean protecting the identity of the folks around me. It means having an understanding and appreciation of histories and experiences that are different than my own, you know? And in doing that, it's not just that we will include, um, you know, non-binary folks and, and trans folks and folks that are oppressed by gender um, within our feminists or womenists, which if it doesn't, then it's not doing it right. But not only will it do that, but it's also going to, it's also gonna include folks with disabilities, low income folks, folks from different backgrounds and and identities and i think that that's something that's just really i think that's something that's really important you all just keep dropping this mic over and over again my goodness uh, <laughs> i want to ask one last question before uh, encouraging the audience to ask questions um so reproductive health is in the news a lot lately um because of the leaked uh draft <laughs> uh, Roe v. Road um, decision uh, that we all fear is coming uh, and have feared for a number of years. Um, why is, for you, is reproductive health, or is it uh, an LGBTQ issue? Um, what, are the, what are the intersections there as you think about this, this term, this, uh, uh, this, it, it's heartbreaking to even think about this. Um, but as we discuss this and knowing that Supreme Court decisions generally come down in June, Pride Month, and it's so interesting how all these things intersect. I remember the year we got marriage and lost voting rights at the same time uh, <laughs> and how just weird that was. Uh, but Amani, I think we start with you this time. Uh, this notion of reproductive health or reproductive justice. Uh, and LGBTQ intersection. 
Yeah, well, that's one of the that's one of the tough things we're going through right now. I think something that stands out to me is that when we think about when we think about justice, when we think about our work, so often for us, what it means is, you know, I talked about earlier standing on the shoulders of giants. What what justice means for us is often standing on the shoulders of giants and doing things that the people before us can do. And then people stand on our shoulders and do the things that we, we can do. When people talk about, you know, the moral anchor of the universe bending toward justice, it's it's saying that we are, I mean, doesn't exactly mean that, but we take it to mean that we're moving a little bit um, and we're moving in the right direction. And right now we are actually seeing a lot of ways that we are not moving in the right direction. And um, I know that this has been something that we've been thinking about for a long time, but this is something that, you know, this is not a fight that I actually thought that I would be fighting. Um, this is a this is a fight that my mother was fighting, and I actually didn't think that this is what I would be. This is not how I thought that I would be spending this this year of my life. And so, um, while we're waiting uh, with bated breath for the Supreme Court decision, we know that this is going to be either the end of Roe or it's going to be substantially gutted. Um, gutted, and we know this because. Just the fact that they're hearing the case means that this court believes that something is different or needs some different interpretation of some way. And so when we're waiting for this, we we absolutely should expect a negative outcome here. This is going to have um, this is going to have an enormous blow, obviously, to abortion, but also it's going to that's going to have a negative impact for folks living in poverty and this is especially going to be harmful for um bipoc communities lgbtq communities and all underrepresented communities because we know that it already does and i think something else that's going to be really important in this time is how lgbtq communities show up because it's important to note that lgbtq people are often left out of discussions about reproductive justice and reproductive rights and those things should absolutely include us obviously we're talking so much about especially we're talking about trans kids um, right now and bodily autonomy um that's something that's very much an issue in the lgbtq community but also Bisexual folks is the largest segment of the LGBTQ community. And I like flipped when I heard this, but over 80% of bisexual women will become pregnant in their lifetime. So abortion is very much, very, very much an LGBTQ issue. Um, we want to, and so we want to consider that. But the last thing, and I, I just want to say this before I go, is that it's going to be really important to talk, think about what LGBTQ, um, what our movement does in this moment, because the Supreme Court, this will have an effect on abortion, but what they're going to be ruling on is actually on privacy and bodily autonomy, and that is going to have broad implications for LGBTQ people. Um, and while we need to work on everything, let's remember this is still the most anti-LGBTQ legislative session we've ever seen. Um, we're seeing uh, just this attack on transgender kids in a way that we have never seen that before. Um, and while um, I think a lot of organizations are going to be looking at, okay, let's look down the pipe. What could this mean for, what could this mean for marriage? What could this mean for something else? We also need to recognize that right now in this moment, um, abortion is something that affects our, our communities. Um, the, all the anti-LGBTQ bills we're seeing, those are also things that are affecting our communities. And if we're gonna tie other things into that, we wanna make sure that we are tying these things together, that we're not dismissing all of the things that we're seeing, that we're not dismissing all of these things and saying this is the thing that really matters. Because I think that from time to time, our movement has done that. And I want to make sure that in this moment, we're paying attention to all those things. And that's what I would say. Yeah, I, this conversation is so difficult because of, um, because of the ways that I've been sort of arguing within our own community about like how we get change to happen as well as, you know, what is happening to us. So I look at these moments and, and I can't tell you very much in line with what Imani was saying, how many times I have to remind folks, this isn't our issue simply because it might affect Obergefell, right? It's, that's not what, it might not just affect Lawrence versus Texas. It might not let you, right? Or to other folks with Griswold, right? It, that mean, right? Sure, it might. But like you said, the money, like our communities need reproductive health and reproductive justice. And justice is different from saying just, you know, like we, you know, we wanted to be able to do, um, you know, just focus on our reproductive health. And 
the justice part is important. And in those moments, um, you know, when you talk about like parts of our community and Gallup just put out there, it's like 54% of our community identifies as bi, right? And so that's, and a lot of people don't even, they think it's like this nice little evenly split pie chart. And it's just not, you know? And and I think that it, that piece of the pie should keep growing and growing and growing as we sort of learn about fluidity and, and just difference in our world. And so to think that we shouldn't get involved until it affects us is, that's exactly how the powers that be work, right? So it is, how many ways can we set everything that each of these different communities is doing on fire, let them all in fight or let them focus on their one thing, the most dangerous thing we could possibly do in this country is to unite and bring that danger on, right? Bring, bring on that, you know, that the good trouble that we get to talk about, right? Bring that on because the more that we can do this work intersectionally, right? Uh, and really doing it in this, we, we know how to be respectful. We know how to do this work. So let's do it. And let's do it across, it's not even across issues, right? Because at the end of the day, these issues are just ways to keep a whole bunch of us from toppling the very small portion of us at the top. So I'm, I'm there. I, yeah. Wow. I celebrate the clap that Imani put in and everything both of you have said. I think my spin, because again, I don't want to reinvent the wheel and I know we're pressed for time. I think as an older millennial, that's what I am born in the early eighties, but still a millennial, which blows my mind. Um, I think it's never occurred to me from my millennial mind that the reproductive justice movement wouldn't include uh, non-binary folks, trans folks, anyway. To me, it's a public health issue. And part of me gets a little concerned when I see it framed so by in a binary context and you know, very second wave still. And that I understand the history, but it kind of sets my teeth on edge, like, oh my, you know, sorry for echoing in anyone's microphone there. Um, so I have wanted for a long time, I've gone to some ACLU forums. I'm a guardian of liberty, so I donate every month. And I'm very active with it. And I've gone to some forums where I have called it out and said, look, I happen to be a cis woman. Uh, I am the demographic that many people would assume would be in danger of losing her reproductive rights, which I am, unfortunately. Uh, but I've also really tried to step up as an ally for our non-binary and trans male folks or trans individuals who also are not necessarily being seen in, in this situation. And I personally, I, kind of following what you're saying, Imani, and also what you've said, Kim, I definitely feel our community needs to have a response. And I have been dying to write an op-ed, especially when it was in the news, talking about why are all these agencies that are supporting us on reproductive rights not naming the LGBTQ factor except for LGBTQ oriented factors. But where I've sometimes struggled with is as an ally to non-binary, gender fluid and trans folks, do I have a right as an ally to write that? Or am I taking away someone's agency? So I've been trying to work with friends to see if they'd be willing to do it. And many are very concerned for their safety and don't want to highlight their situation, which I totally respect as well, because Lord knows as an Afro-Indigenous disability woman, I get that. But I guess this leaves me saying, well, what do I do? So for me, it's like, everything you all have said, but also remembering that this needs to, at the forefront, put these individuals who are also facing real consequences if this, when, not if, but when this goes down or when God forbid it's even gutted, because that's basically going down too. And how can I support their agency? while, well, like you said, Imani, still protecting my own as well. So I guess it's something I struggle with daily and in pride. And I really feel the conversation needs to keep going. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Ah, and on that note, I um, want to open up space before asking one last question uh, for our panelists. I um, want to open up space for the audience to, to ask questions. And Andrew, is there a particular way you want to do this? Should folks put the questions in the chat? Do you want folks to get yeah, off folks are mic? welcome to put Folks are welcome to put things in the chat. If they'd like to raise their hand, they can do so as well and meet themselves and ask or directly um, either way that folks are comfortable with. Don't be shy. Someone just put something in. I think that was Andrew. Oh, that is... yeah. Sorry, see, reinventing the wheel, apologies. <laughs> you all have done such a great job of uh, 
making the case and uh, explaining things. I guess folks don't have questions. <laughs> ah, Jill, I see you waving your hand. <laughs> what you got? Great to see everybody. Here we go. Um, I love this conversation. It's astounding. And my question has always been and continues, we're busy human beings, right? Everybody has a lot on their plate. They have things that matter to them. Um, and the, the need to be, uh, to make sure that we're not cutting anybody out, that everybody's thoughts and ideas and, um, and needs and are, are included. But how do you do that when it, because it can feel that the thing you're, you're working on just got watered down. You know, like, you know, if we're talking about um, women's issues and then we go into some other things then it, it can feel like, well, we've now not talked about women's issues anymore. We're talking about, but we really are talking about it. It's a bad question, but like, how do you, how do you expand and be inclusive without losing the, the thing that you're trying to make because it's so hard to make a difference, even in one thing, let alone multiple things. I, that's, I love that question because, you know, it's one that we worry about. And, and it's also the place where language gets really tricky, right? It, it's a place that we, you know, if you're particularly self-aware, you know, you, you find yourself being like, oh, I don't want to say the same, anything wrong. So I'm not going to say anything. Right. And so there's a few things, right? It's we talk about brave conversations, right? Just like you bravely stepped up and you asked a question that you thought was maybe a little awkwardly worded for you. I, you know, fine, name it. Say, look, this may not come out in the way that I in, my intent is this, right? And you know, and and be open to, I'm sorry, that was worded, or I'm sorry, I didn't realize that's what I said. Great, right? That's wonderful. I also think that sometimes it really helps not to take identity fully out of something, but also sometimes we can talk about issues, right? Issue areas, things that we need. So if we're talking about reproductive health, right? Or, you know, making sure that gynecologists have their shit together or whatever, I'm swearing, right? Or whatever it is, right? Um, then you can have a broader conversation that can also center, you know, assigned female at birth folks, right? Or can also center trans folks or can center both, however it is. But if you're talking about that issue, you can talk about access and, you know, we, taking out obstacles, things like that. That's one way I think of it sometimes. Um, for me, following up on what Kim said, and I like what you said about area issues too, I call it the honoring the ancestors conversation in the sense that I think it's important to honor our our collective ancestors, i.e. the second waivers who put reproductive justice on the table for sure and still are. And like you said, Jill, still not watering down that there are still issues affecting cis women and, and agree with that. But at the same time, as we honor our ancestors, the ancestors also recognize that new generations came from their efforts, which is where I think Kim Fountain is kind of speaking to you as well, even though I don't want to speak for you, Kim, uh, terribly ironic. And uh, I feel that, um, that's where it comes from. So by maybe honoring the ancestors who started the movement and are still talking about issues that are still affecting us now very much, it also makes room for us though to acknowledge the new generation in the sense of that's where I like for myself, the term African-American. I am a person of West African heritage originally. They had a tradition of honoring the ancestors long before we were brought over here and enslaved and became, but we're now a new culture, a new, uh, a segment of American life that has maintained an aspect of the old but has created something new is impactful. It's the same with all movements. So honoring the current generation and, and working with the current generation to talk about how the movement has developed doesn't mean we no longer honor the ancestors. We still do and we still acknowledge those issues, but we also make room for growth because it's all about growth. For me, please. I completely agree with both of these things. And I think that is, Jill, great to see you. I think that's actually the exact answer that you're, that you're looking for. You know, it's, and I think it's also okay, okay to acknowledge that in part, you know, what abortion, what abortion was doing was 
really to control women. And that was that was something that, and it's okay to honor that. It's okay to know that that's, but Lauren, you said this so beautifully, we have to be, we have to be able to be more inclusive. And I wanna get back to when I said before that our job is more complicated, it's more difficult because our opponents don't have to do that. But in order for us to do this right, in order for us to widen our tent, to broaden, to bring more people in, this is what we have to do. And that's not a bad thing. And that's what we need to get away from. This doesn't, liberation is like healthcare. It's like policies. We all, they're better, they're safer, we're stronger when we all have them. And so I know that it's scary because we are so often, we are so used to being overlooked that bringing, bringing more folks in, I know that that is scary for folks, but that is the way to liberation. And for sort of your larger question, um, Jill, I think that also this has to be our larger movement strategy. And it's about coming together so that we are teaching each other how to be more intersectional. Because we say that word, we throw it around like we all are talking about the same thing, and we absolutely are not. But how we're going to get there is by working with folks. You know, um, Baird Rustin said, you have to work within every other uh, movement for the freedom of people. And that is maybe one of my favorite, it's certainly one of my favorite quotes of all time. And right now today, it's my favorite quote. But I love that because it's, because it reminds us actually how to how to do the work intersectionally. We throw that word around like we know what it, what it means. And it doesn't mean the same thing to us. But when we work together, when we work with all movements, that's how we're going to be intersectional. And Jill, I think that's I think that's the answer. That's what we need to do here. Now it's harder for us, but that is still the answer. Love it. Any more questions? Look it around. All the little boxes. Um, there are many things that I've taken to heart today. And one of them is something Kim said, and that's to know when it's time to go. Uh, <laughs> so we're not gonna force anything. We're not gonna force any more questions, but I do have one last question for the panelists. And it's, and I asked this question because, you know, you are all, you know, we've thrown around a few uh, curse words now. So I'm just gonna throw another one in the mix, badass, badass women. Um, and I uh, know that you do a lot of work on behalf of others uh, that includes your own identities, right? Um, so I wanna ask you, what brings you joy? You, you personally. I don't remember where I started. Uh, so whose turn it is to go first. So I'm just gonna let y'all fight over that and tell me what brings you joy. I'm going to jump in. I got it. Okay. Three things. Three things. <laughs> Civil disobedience, whiskey, and knitting. I'm going to be very upfront. I love all those in equal points, portions. That is me. End of story. <laughs> That's just genius. <laughs> that is absolute genius. I would poke an eye out with a knitting needle, but go you. Hooray. We need the knitters of the world. Um, you know, I... Um, I love civil dis disobedience. I love that one. I love, um, you know, collaborative work. I think that's great. I love my dogs, love my cat, <laughs> you know, those kinds of moments, you know, like I just, I can just, you know, take long walks with them. It's like an in search of kind of thing, right? Long walks and through the woods with my dogs kind of thing. Um, that makes me happy. And, you know, but what, but what restores my energy and what restores my desire to keep doing the work is this moment. Right, this moment when we're, and I know that that says, it's probably somebody's answer for every panel, but seriously, like being here, being with everybody who's sort of signed in, like I know that I might not know or see all the people who are on this, on the, you know, all the people, but I know you're out there, right? And knowing you're out there means that like when I do my work and I feel isolated, I, I'm like, nope, I know that there are other folks out there like me. And so that restores my energy. Um, it's been such a pleasure to be on a panel with y'all. Um, I would say, you know, my favorite part about movement work is, um, is also the hardest part. It's the bra being brave part, you know, and that's hard to do. Um, it's scary. You feel like you're doing something that you've never seen done, or you 
in the ways that you have seen it done. Um, you feel like you could never do that. And um, one of the ways that I get to practice being brave is by uh, building things and tinkering with things and putting things together. And that's something that I really, really love doing. It's not something that I'm particularly good at, but it's something that I love a lot. And what it reminds me when I do these things, when I take guitar lessons, even though I'm not particularly good at it, or when I, I've just started um, taking watches apart, uh, I like watches a lot. And, or when I build something with my hands, um, I do it not because I'm good at it. I, I do it because I want something done and I think that I can do it. And practicing being brave in those moments and figuring it out, um, it brings me so much joy, but I also think it really changes who I am and I think it makes me better at my job too. And I do wanna say as a follow-up, I agree with both Kim and Imani about listening and, and um, challenging and, and also advocating and, and being brave. I definitely support those two. It's just when you said my first three, I had to say that, but. <laughs> I appreciate you because, uh, you know, for, for me, I'll say uh, a good sci-fi book, um, a glass of bourbon or single malt scotch, occasionally a cigar, um, and conversations like this, because, you know, when I was asked for suggestions of who should be on this panel, I'm like, who am I going to have fun with? Who are we going to have a great conversation with? And so I am so happy that each of you said yes. Uh, this conversation just made my day uh, in a couple of days, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew, do you have, or Jagadisha, do you have any housekeeping things you need to announce before we depart? Uh, sorry, I'm still kind of taking everything in. I mean, this has just been such a wonderful panel and it's been just such an, an honor and pleasure to uh, bear witness and participate in this way with you folks. And thank you so much for agreeing to participate on this panel. Thank you, Kim, for suggesting these wonderful folks to uh, participate and for agreeing to moderate on our behalf. Uh, just a couple of events that are coming up uh, later this evening. There is the uh, visibility impact of funds by Plus Community Ripples. And our one of our faculty members here, Lauren, Dr. Lauren Beach, will be participating on that. And so they'll be talking about uh, intersectional by plus specific programming in the context of pride. Uh, and then on the 23rd, uh, we have a special guest coming, uh, Christy M M Mallory, uh, who is uh, spon it's sponsored by the Medical and Social Sciences Equity Hub. And it's part of their Food for Thought series. And Dr. Mallory um, will be, sorry, um, not Dr. Mallory, I said JD, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Mallory will be joining us and speaking on the current legal landscape for transgender youth in the United States. Um, and then there are a bunch of uh, other pride events that are happening. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and in closing, I just want to thank everyone, uh, panelists, moderator, and participants here for your time and participation and for you know helping just co-create such a really wonderful experience as we, we celebrate pride. Um, I definitely am taking away a lot. Uh, you know, it's gonna take me a while to process, but you know, just being part, just being here has brought me joy. That's my plug, I'll, I'll add that. Has brought me joy, brought me joy. That this is just happening and that you folks have really um, participated in co-creating this space. Uh, anything I, we need to add, Andrew? I think we are all set, thank you. Okay, so with that, again, thank you everyone for your participation today. Thank you to all of our attendees for taking time to participate and help us, uh, you know, explore and celebrate what you know pride means for us in the context of the wonderful uh, panels that we've had today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone.